Thank you. I want to talk today about, uh, about some work that some of our students at UT Dallas are doing on justice in Texas. And you'll note there's a question mark about justice in Texas because what we do is we work with the Innocence Project of Texas. And what the students do is the Innocence Project will give us case files on people who are in prison for very serious crimes. Often it's murder, uh, rape, or murder and rape. A lot of these people are sentenced to prison for 45 years and up. And we get the case files and we review the case files to basically see if there's any chance this person might be innocent. And if there is a chance this person might be innocent, is there any way you can really prove it? Of course, the best way to prove it is with DNA e evidence because DNA is the gold standard. That's the conclusive proof of guilt or innocence. But one thing that, that we did before we started reviewing these cases, and by the way, we've identified several cases where we think the person might be innocent, and those cases are in various stages in the legal process in, in Texas right now. Most of those cases are cases where we are trying to get access to uh, to, to the evidence that was used so we can do DNA testing uh, in these cases. But before we did that, we tried to look at what the problems in the Texas judicial system were. And the way we did that is to look at cases where people went to prison and were proven innocent. And we tried to see if we could determine what went wrong in those cases. Probably the most famous case of innocence is a case involving Tim Cole. He was convicted of being the Texas Tech rapist. Uh, he, uh, he died in prison. He actually had a problem with asthma, and he had an asthma attack while he was in prison and, and uh, died before help could be uh, obtained for him. He was convicted in 1986. He died in 1999. But in 2009, 10 years after his death in prison, DNA evidence conclusively proved he was innocent. And his case is particularly important because his brother began a, a, a lobbying campaign to provide compensation for people who were put in prison and, uh, and were later proved to be innocent. Uh, and that's known as the Tim Cole Act. And now people can get compensation uh, for the time they were, they were in prison and were innocent. But it's very interesting to take a look and see what happened with, uh, with, with Tim Cole and why things went wrong in Tim Cole's case. Uh, Texas Tech in, in the mid-1980s had uh, numerous rapes occurring on or around campus. And so everyone concluded it's a serial rapist. The description of the serial rapist was it, wa it was a young black man, interestingly, a young black man who smoked. Now, the police ignored that when they arrested Tim, Tim Cole because, as I said, Tim Cole died of asthma. And Tim Cole had had asthma all his life. Well, one thing people with asthma don't do is smoke. Uh, and so Tim Cole had not smoked, but the police ignored that. Uh, instead, he was one of the very few black males going to Texas Tech University at the time. And what, what happened was, was quite extraordinary when you think about it. And when you think about tunnel vision, how you can focus on someone and forget about any alternatives. 
Uh, because what happened was there were these series of rapes going on at Texas Tech, and the police decided they would bait the rapist. And the way they would bait the rapist is they had a policewoman who was exceptionally attractive, and they put her out in the area where the rapes had been, had been occurring, walking around in, where the rapes had been occurring. Unfortunately, Tim Cole was in the area, and Tim Cole came up to her and basically was flirting with her. And, and at, at one point said to her, would you like a ride back across campus? He was in his car. Would you like a ride back across campus? And she said no and immediately went to her supervisor and said, that's our guy. Well, in the meantime, after Tim Cole is incarcerated, Interestingly, the rapes continue to happen. So how do you deal with the problem that you've arrested the Texas Tech rapist, but the rapes continue to happen? The police say, it's got to be a copycat rapist. There's another rapist out there that's copying Tim Cole, and that's why we're still having rapes never thinking, of course, that they might have had the wrong guy to begin with. Well, after Tim Cole was convicted and sentenced to prison for 25 years, uh, and after he died, the actual rapist was, was in prison for still another sexual crime later on, and he wrote Tim Cole's mother confessing that he was the Texas Tech rapist. They did DNA testing to see if he was actually the Texas Tech rapist, and lo and behold, he was the Texas Tech rapist. But there, were, there, were, there was a tremendous opportunity here for the police to think, do we have the right man? Instead of thinking, do we have the right man, they're thinking there's a copycat rapist out there. Once they focused on Tim Cole, they were going to convict Tim Cole no matter what. And they weren't going to consider alternatives. They didn't worry about the fact that Tim Cole didn't smoke, although all the rape victims said that the rapist smelled of tobacco, they didn't worry that these rapes were still going on where there was no way that Tim Cole could have, could have done those things. So one thing we concluded in our class was in any kind of criminal investigation, you really have to watch for tunnel vision. You really have to watch that you're not excluding alternatives too quickly. Most recently, another interesting case came about. There's been a tremendous amount of publicity over this case. Over here, the, the, the man in the suit is Judge Ken Anderson. He used to be the district attorney of Williamson County, and then he became a district court judge. And over here is Michael Morton. Michael Morton was convicted of murdering his wife. And the person who convicted him was Judge, was, was Judge Ken Anderson. The interesting thing about this case is you have real clear evidence of official misconduct. Uh, When the district attorney was prosecuting the case, the district attorney was aware of certain facts that he did not disclose to the defense. 
think about these facts and see if you think these facts could have possibly proven the innocence of Michael Morton. The wife who was murdered had a credit card that was stolen. After she was dead, someone used the credit card. But by that time, Michael Morton was in jail. The district attorney knew it and didn't tell the defense. The murder was observed by Michael Morton's three-year-old son. The three-year-old son told the sheriff investigators, a monster killed my mother. He had a big mustache. He was a monster, and the sheriff specifically said, was it your father? And he said, no. Now, he's only a three-year-old. But a monster with a big mustache killed my mother and it wasn't, it wasn't my father. That was not turned over to the defense. The defense didn't know anything at all about that. Neighbors said they had seen a van in the neighborhood and the van had stopped by Michael Morton's house and a man had gotten out of the van and had walked out in the woods behind Michael Morton's house. That was not reported to the defense. There is a Supreme Court decision, uh, it's, called, it's called Brady versus Maryland, which requires prosecutors to turn over evidence to the defense where that evidence might prove the innocence of the defense. That's ignored by District Attorney Ken Anderson and Michael Morton is convicted. He is in prison, you will note, from 1987 until 2011. He had a life sentence, but in 2011 he finally got DNA testing. And it's, a, it's an interesting story about the DNA testing. In the front yard of the Morton house, there was a scarf. It was a bloody scarf in the front yard. And the, actually, it was the murder victim's brother who found the scarf and turned it over to the police. And the police just put it in an evidence box. The Innocence Project found out about this scarf and they ask for DNA, DNA testing on the blood on the scarf. Judge Ken Anderson, by that uh, Ken Anderson by that time had become a judge, but his first assistant district attorney became the district attorney. John Bradley was that person's name. And that district attorney, John Bradley, fought testing on the scarf saying this was a waste of time, it was useless, no new evidence could be found, Michael Morton was obviously guilty. And John Bradley fought the testing on the scarf for years. Finally, a judge granted testing on the scarf. Interestingly, our murder victim's blood was on the scarf, and somebody else's blood was on the scarf. But it wasn't Michael Morton's blood. It was a serial killer's blood who had been imprisoned for other murders. And ultimately, that serial killer was named Norwood. He was recently tried for the murder of Michael Morton's wife and was convicted of that murder and Michael Morton was released from prison. One cause of innocence here is clearly official misconduct because this evidence should have been turned over to the defense prior to Michael Morton's trial and just was not. Interestingly, 
Judge Anderson actually suffered some consequences. In most cases of official misconduct, this doesn't happen. But Judge Anderson wound up spending six days in jail. And he had to give up his law license, and he had to resign from the bench. And John Bradley, the district attorney who fought the DNA testing on the scarf, had to run for re-election and was defeated because the person who ran against John Bradley said John Bradley had acted improperly as a district attorney. So there actually were consequences in the case of this, uh, of this misconduct. The interesting thing about this case of innocence is another law was passed that is of great, great importance in the criminal justice system in Texas, and that's the Michael Morton Act. Now prosecutors must basically provide their files to defense lawyers. In the old days, prosecutors were very selective in what they provided. You can see that in, the, in, in this case. But now they must provide their files to the defense. This should bring about a remarkable change in the way uh, we, we have major criminal cases where there are issues of, uh, of misconduct. And finally, one of the most interesting cases of all, and, and unlike Tim Cole, unlike Michael Morton, Cameron Todd Willingham has not been exonerated. He was convicted and given the death penalty for an arson murder of his three children. Actually, what you see in the back is, is his house that he allegedly burned down. What we probably have in the case of Michael, uh, of Cameron Todd Willingham, what we probably have among other things is a case where bad science was used to convict someone. Bad fi fire science was used to convict someone. And I'll give you just a uh, couple of indications of that. It used to be that if you saw unusual charring in a fire where uh, a particular part of a fire was just charcoal-like, whereas the other parts of, of, of the wood were just burned, there would be a particular part that had just turned to, to charcoal basically, it just, it just where it, a fire had obviously burned unusually hot. The theory was always an accelerant was used. That's where someone poured the gasoline or whatever it might be that started the fire. In Cameron Todd Willingham's case, there was charring on a floor. And the testimony was, that's where he poured the accelerant. What we now know is that charring can occur just because it's an area where it gets the most air. No one ever bothered to look in that case, but where the charring occurred was right in the middle of where there were four open windows. So it was modern fire scientists say the cause was not an accelerant, the cause was air. Uh, another thing that was that old-time fire scientists used to argue is that if glass crazed, if, if in, a, in, a, in a fire you will you will see how glass uh, sort of looks like it's been covered with snowflakes uh, if that happened, uh, that's evidence that a fire burned unusually hot because of an accelerant. Now we know that when fires burn, oftentimes there's something called flashover, 
where you get a fire burning and suddenly the whole room is engulfed by fire. And when the whole room is engulfed by fire, the glass crazes as well. So that's not evidence of arson. The other testimony in the case was quite amazing. Uh, th unfortunately, Cameron Todd Willingham was a fan of, uh, of Iron Maiden. And he had an Iron Maiden poster. And the, the testimony was that that was evidence that he was a devil worshiper and was a supporter of violence and death. And he had a Led Zeppelin poster. And the testimony was that showed he was part of a devil worshiping cult as well. And he had a tattoo of a skull and a serpent. And a psychiatrist uh, from Dallas, a psychiatrist named James Grigson, testified that meant he was a sociopath. And if you let him go, he would murder again. Because you could tell because of his tattoo. Then we had a snitch. We had a jailhouse informant who said, Cameron Todd Willingham confessed to me that he killed his three children, that he burned them up because he was mad at his wife. What we have just discovered last week, remember his execution is in 2004, what we have just discovered last week is the Innocence Project has gotten the prosecutor's files and the prosecutor had made a deal with the snitch we will reduce your sentence if you are willing to testify against Cameron Todd Willingham. Now, of course, a person could still testify to the truth, but shouldn't the defense have known that a deal was made with the snitch? The defense, the, the district attorney had said at the time of the trial, no deal was made. This snitch was just an upstanding citizen who wanted to testify about this terrible murderer. Now, in 2014, we know that was not all the story. So what we see in this case, I think, are, are several things, but that we should be very cautious about snitch testimony and that we should be very worried about, uh, about bad science, whether it's bad psychiatric science or bad fire science. So those cases have really done a lot to shape thinking of people uh, who, are, who are working in the Innocence Project. And let me just show you how this applies in, uh, in some cases that our students have, uh, have done some work with. Uh, what we did one summer, just as a fun project, what, what I did is I got six cases from the Innocence Project that they had worked on and basically gave the cases to 12 students and said, we're going to write a book. We're going to write a book about these six cases where it's a study of what went wrong. And, uh, and so this is basically the, the manuscript that the students produced from this. But this is David Pope. He was convicted in, in Dallas of aggravated uh, sexual assault. He was sentenced to 45 years. He served in prison from 1986 to 2001. Several things wrong with his case. The rape victim said the rapist was blonde and tanned. Sometimes when you're wanting to identify someone, you do a lineup. You've probably seen these lineups on TV sometimes. And in theory, with the lineup, the people should look the same. You know, they should look very similar. They should basically roughly meet the description 
of the perpetrator. The only blonde, tanned person in the lineup was David Pope. The rape victim looks at the lineup and says, it's him. It's that blonde, tanned guy. And she becomes more convinced, by the way, over time that that's the guy. The other thing that was used to convict him, I mean, this is truly, in all sorts of ways, a very weird case. Because this, this is a rape, by the way, not very far from here at all. This is a rape where the rapist uh, rapes this woman and then regular, regularly phones her and talks about that he is in love with her and he wants to come over and rape her again. I know this sounds unbelievably bizarre, but this is what happened. And even odder, the rape victim carries on lengthy conversations with him over the phone and goes to the police and they start recording the phone conversations. And the result is that at the trial, voice spectrography is used. What that is, is the voice waves of a person are recorded on a sheet of paper. And what the expert witness for the prosecution said is, I can record the voice waves of the person who is calling the rape victim, and I can compare those voice waves with David Pope, and they match perfectly. The problem is this is, this is bad science. You can't do a match like that. So he is convicted on junk science, on misidentification, probably caused by a bad lineup. Finally, in 2001, he gets out because DNA testing is done, and he is not the, uh, the rapist. One of the nice things about Dallas County, by the way, is Dallas County keeps evidence forever. Lots of counties in Texas, once a person's appeals are done, the evidence is just thrown away. Dallas County keeps evidence, we know it keeps evidence for at least 30 years and maybe longer. So you can go back to the rape kit and do DNA testing on that rape kit even though that rape kit is 20 or 30 years old. In most counties in Texas, that would have been thrown away a long time ago. Uh, DNA testing has been around basically since the 1990s now uh, and commonly used since the 2000s. But if you've got a rape kit, in this case, if you've got a rape kit that is a 1985 rape kit, you can go back now and do DNA testing on that rape kit. This is Joe Sidney Williams. He is convicted in Waco. This is, a, this is an extraordinary case that, uh, that, that we looked at where we just wondered how in the heck were these two men convicted. But Joe Sidney Williams is convicted along with Calvin Washington. Joe, Joe Sidney was in prison from 1987 to 1983, and his co-murderer, according to the Waco courts, Calvin Washington was in prison from 1987 to 2001. They're both convicted of a rape murder in Waco, Texas. The uh, the evidence that is used is that Joe Sidney Williams and Calvin Washington, the term was ran together. They were buddies. They palled around together. And at the, 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 the murder rape victim had been bitten 
there was a bite mark expert brought in by the district attorney who said Calvin Washington didn't bite the victim, but we think, we're not sure, but we think Joe Sidney Williams bit the victim. So we have questionable junk science, bite mark testimony, but the, uh, the thing that really got them is eight people testified that they had heard these two men confessing to the murder rape. Seven of those people were in jail in Waco and said they had heard these men confessing. They all got reduced sentences. The eighth person claimed Calvin Washington was in this motel room in Waco. He said he happened to be walking outside the window of the hotel and heard at that precise moment Calvin Washington confessing that he had done the rape murder. So we had eight people paraded in testifying they had heard these two men confess. The problem is they were all lies. The seven snitches who were in the Waco jail obviously did it for a reduced sentence. This eighth guy, who knows why he did it? Uh, the guy who allegedly was walking by the door and heard the confession. But finally DNA evidence showed that they did not do it and DNA evidence showed who did it. The, the interesting thing is a Waco police officer at the very beginning of the case said, I think I know who did it. I think it's a man named Benny Carroll who has just been released from prison on a rape charge and uh, he lived only two blocks away from the victim. I think he did it. That police officer was ignored. They went after these two guys. The DNA evidence finally showed in 2001 that it was Benny Carroll who did it. The problem was Benny Carroll was always already in prison for another rape by that time and had died in prison. So he couldn't do much about, uh, about Benny Carroll. This is something you may have read about recently. This is James Woodard. Notice how long he was in prison, 1981 to 2009. Uh, last summer, he was arrested on a domestic violence charge. It's not clear that there really was a domestic violence, but he was arrested on a domestic violence charge. By the, the victim of the domestic violence got a protective order. By mistake, the judge put James Woodard's address on the protective order rather than the victim's address on the protective order. So when James Woodard went, got out of jail on bail and went back home, he violated the protective order. So he was taken back to jail. He was a diabetic. He went into a diabetic coma and he died in the Dallas County Jail. You don't want to go into a diabetic coma in the Dallas County Jail. He died in the Dallas County Jail last summer. But he was convicted of murdering his, his, uh, his girlfriend and, uh, and was convicted in 1981. He came and spoke to my class. It was very, very interesting. Uh, he, was, uh, he, was, he was bitter but very forgiving. He had gone through a religious experience while he was in jail and so he, in prison, so he was remarkably forgiven forgiving of people. But what happened to him was there was testimony he did it. He was the last person with his girlfriend. The prosecutor knew otherwise but didn't tell the defense. The prosecutor knew that his girlfriend 
was actually with three men after she was with James Woodard. And the interesting thing is, two of those three men had been convicted rapists. Well, her body uh, was, was found. The idea was it must be the boyfriend because it's always the boyfriend that does these kinds of murders. And so the result is until DNA evidence proved otherwise, he is in prison from 1981 to 2009. I really enjoyed visiting with this fellow. I went, he lives now in a little town in East Texas called Emory, Texas. It's the county seat of Raines County. It's about 2,200 people. And I went out to his house. He had taken an old house and basically built it into a really nice house with his own hands. He was very skilled in terms of carpentry work and working with tools. He was convicted of rape, sexual abuse, and burglary in Dallas, got a life sentence, and served just about 10 years in prison. And it's a fascinating story. This was, this was Irving. This happened in Irving. Fascinating story. He is picked up because there are a series of burglaries going on in Irving. And I think Donald Good had been a fence. I think he was selling stolen goods. I can't prove that, but I think he was selling stolen goods. Anyway, the police picked him up to question him about the burglaries. And a police detective, Detective Curtis, said to him, and he knew Donald Wayne Good because they had had some run-ins before, he said, Don, either you confess to these burglaries or I'm going to stick you with this rape that just happened. Well, Don Wayne Good told me he thought the detective was just lying to him, you know, trying to threaten him. And he said, oh, hell, leave me alone. You know I didn't do a rape. Let me go back to my, uh, to my cell. Detective Curtis said, all right, if you're going to be like that, but before you go back to your cell, I want to take some pictures of you. Doesn't that sound odd? I want to take some pictures of you. And he got out a camera, and he took a picture of Donald Wayne Good, and he didn't like it. So he took another picture, and he took another picture. What he was doing, we now know, is he was darkening the picture because here was the problem. The rape victim, it's interesting that the, the rape victim described the rapist as being a blonde, tanned man, just like the Pope case, which I find really intriguing. Donald Wayne Good, even today, is red-headed and has freckles. What Detective Curtis did is he was darkening the picture so you couldn't tell that he was red-headed and you couldn't tell he was freckled. And then somehow the victim in what's called a photo array where you put the pictures out and you identify people by their pictures, the victim picks him out of the photo array. And once she picks him out of the photo array, lo and behold, she picks him out of an in-person lineup. And once she picks him out of an in-person lineup, even though he even today has red hair and freckles, at trial she says, he did it. He's the one who did it. It all goes back to the manipulated photos, of course. Well, Donald, Donald Wayne Good ultimately got DNA testing. Interestingly, he did it on his own. He has very little education. But he wrote, while he was in prison, a petition for DNA testing. And based on his petition for DNA testing, he was able to prove that he was not the rapist. Of course, he was in prison almost 10 years in the meantime. But he was able to prove that he was not the rapist. The problem was, to collect money, 
you have to ha not ha commit any other felonies. And he committed another felony. He had, he stole some tools out of a pickup truck. Turned out it was a felony. So he couldn't collect anything for his nine years in prison. What he did was file a civil rights action saying the police officer had denied him his civil rights and uh, trying to get compensation that way. And it's nearly impossible to win these kinds of suits. But the city of Irving, after taking the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and after spending about $400,000 in legal fees, the city of Irving decided to settle with him. And he was able to get a million dollars. Uh, and, and what I enjoyed more than anything when I visited with him is he said, after I'd talked with him about an hour, he said, come out to the garage, I want to show you something. And he took me out to this garage and he said, I built this garage myself. I poured the concrete myself. And in the garage was this 2006 Harley Davidson. It was manicured. I mean, it was spotless. And it was one of the finest Harley Davidsons you'd ever want to buy. And he started it up and then just, just so I could hear the motor. And he said to me, he said, you know what this is? And I said, what? And he said, this is Detective Curtis's present to me. Uh, but again, we had a problem with official misconduct. What happened to Detective Curtis? Well, when he reached retirement age, he retired at full retirement, and he's now a reserve deputy sheriff out in West Texas where he retired. That's the norm. In the cases of official misconduct, not much happens uh, to people. This is another person we had come and speak to the class. He served in prison from 1984 to 2011 uh, for raping two young girls. The interesting thing about this case is it's nothing but a case of misidentification. After the rapes occurred, a couple days after the rapes occurred, these two young girls were in on the balcony of their apartment complex. They looked out from the balcony of their apartment complex and saw Johnny Pinchback. And one of the girls said to the other one, that's him. And the other girl looked and said, yeah, that's him. And based on their testimony, he was convicted. Again, DNA evidence showed in 2011 he was not, not the rapist and he's now uh, out of prison. Of all the people I interviewed, a Pinchback is the most personable, the brightest, uh, the sharpest of all these people. I was very, very uh, impressed with him. But as he said, when he, by the time he got out of prison, the world had changed. He was amazed how much Dallas had grown. He, he, he couldn't recognize Dallas when he got out of prison. And he was fascinated by things like cell phones. Wow, people have this device where you can, you can talk, you can carry a phone around in your pocket. He said he went to the supermarket and he, he, he just kept watching the scanners. He couldn't believe that supermarkets had scanners. And it was like he was starting over in life because so much had changed during the time that he had been in prison. And finally, George Rodriguez. He's convicted of aggravated sexual assault of a child and aggravated kidnapping of that same child. He served from 1987 to 2005. This is a mistaken identification case as well. The victim says he did it, but he actually didn't do it. DNA shows now that a person named Izzy Yanez actually did it as opposed to George Rodriguez. But here's the, here's the thing that goes back to tunnel vision. 
when George Rodriguez was being tried for this, another defendant was being tried in the Harris County Courts in an adjoining courtroom. And in that adjoining courtroom, the, the other defendant was saying, George Rodriguez didn't do it. Izzy Yanez did it. But no one in George Rodriguez's courtroom heard that testimony. And George Rodriguez wound up going uh, to prison from 1987 to 2005. It's, it's, a, it's a different way of failing to look at alternatives because there had been two witnesses who had said Izzy Yanez did it. And then there was a defendant in the Harris County Courthouse saying the same thing. All of this was ignored leading to the conviction of George Rodriguez. So what our class concluded in looking at the justice system in Texas is these are your basic problems with the justice system in Texas. One is mistaken identification. There's not much you can do about mistaken identification except to be skeptical about identifications because people really do make mistakes in identifying people. Especially, by the way, if it's across races. Whites have a hard time with identifications of blacks. Blacks have a hard time with whites. Cross-racial identifications are especially questionable. Another real problem is snitches. What we, de what we determined in, in our research in the class is if you offer someone in jail a reduced sentence, they'll testify to anything. They just want a way to get out of jail. And if it hurts another person in the process, too bad. Gets me out of jail. One really has to be extremely questioning of the testimony of snitches. What we've already talked about, one of the problems of police is just focusing on a suspect too quickly. The problem of tunnel vision. Junk science has, has, has really become a, uh, a, uh, a big thing, particularly regarding fires. Right now, the state of Texas is reviewing every case of a person in prison on an arson charge out of a belief that they may have been convicted on the basis of bad fire science. Right now, Every case is being reviewed that involves dog scent testimony, which is an absurd thing where uh, in Fort Bend County, there was, a, there was a deputy who claimed his dog had such good scent that if, for example, you had stolen money you could let that dog smell that stolen money and then send that dog out in this classroom and it would alert on the student who stole the money. It could smell that person on the money. There have been scores of cases involving dog scent testimony which have been thrown out of court now. Another problem is official misconduct. I think the Michael Morton case will tremendously deal with that. And the final thing is just the quality of legal representation. In all these innocence cases, every one of these innocence cases, it's not, it's not that these people are all Hispanic or all black or all white. It's these people are all poor. These people are all poor and they get appointed lawyers who are paid very little money. There are counties in Texas where appointed lawyers in a capital murder case are paid a total of $350. If you've got a lawyer in a major case who's paid a total of $350, how much work do you think that lawyer is going to do? A capital murder case, if you had money, 
It's probably going to cost you $100,000. A poor person doesn't have much of a chance, even though they have a right to legal representation, what they've got is a right to poor legal representation. I actually asked Don Good when I was visiting in Emory, Texas, I said, what did you think of the appointed lawyers who represented you? And he said, you get what you pay for. And I thought, what a, what a, what a perfect explanation of the problem of poor legal representation in Texas. So those are sort of the, the sort of things that we're doing in our class at UTD and I hope if you transfer to in your junior and senior year I hope you'll come to UTD and I hope you'll take a class like this. Thanks very much. <laughs> yes, it's an undergraduate class. There are only two such classes in the country where undergraduates work with the Innocence Project on Innocence Cases. It's called the Innocence Workshop. The Innocence Workshop. Well, Dr. Champagne, would you care to comment about uh, the post-Willingham uh, politics that took place oh. in the state of Texas and Rick Perry's so-called panel that was uh, rigged over the switches? Yeah, the, 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 there is a commission, the Texas Forensic Science Commission, uh, that is, is uh, the, the members are appointed by the governor of Texas. Well, the Texas Forensic Science Commission was going to look into the Cameron Todd Willingham case. And the, the, the problem that they had was the terms of office of several members of the commission, including the chairman of the commission, were expiring. Governor Perry decided not to reappoint anybody, to reappoint new members of the commission and to appoint a new chairman of the commission. And so instead of looking into the Cameron Todd Willingham case with the new Perry appointments, they decided not to look into the Cameron Todd Willingham case. Interestingly, the chairman of that commission that was appointed by Governor Perry was John Bradley who was the district attorney in the Michael Morton case who fought for years the testing of blood on that scarf. So, but, but I think the idea was Governor Perry simply did not want an exoneration of someone who had been executed. It's even better. It's uh, the, the, uh, the Tim Cold Act now gives you $80,000 for every year that you were in prison on a crime where you were innocent, and then you get an annuity as well, an $80,000 annuity for every year. So someone like Johnny Pinchback, who was in prison for almost 30 years, is... Uh, is really a multi-millionaire. It's interesting, the first thing he did when he got out of prison, the, 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 the first thing he did with his compensation is he bought a new house for his mother. And the next thing he did is he bought a little farm out south of Dallas where he and his wife live. He, interestingly, he married by proxy while he, he, was, while he was in prison meaning he got married, but another man outside of prison had to stand in for him in the ceremony. But, uh, but his wife stuck with him, and when he always believed in him, and when he got out of prison, they're, they're, they're still married, and very happily married, and living on a farm south of Dallas now. But if you, if you go in for this long period of time, you can come out a, a, a multi-millionaire, although if you're like James Woodard, you also come out really messed up. I mean, he was really having major psychological problems uh, when he was arrested on this domestic violence charge and short...
you are probably going to have fewer cases like this because now if there's DNA to test, usually the prosecutor will test it before trial. So DNA cases are probably dying away. Uh, still, you've got some non-DNA cases. We have worked on a case, I can't go into detail about it because it's in the legal process right now, but we have worked on a case that uh, where a man was convicted of a double murder. This is not a DNA case, but a man was convicted of a double murder. It was the man's wife and the man's stepson. And you look at the case and you think, is this a double murder or a murder-suicide? And let me, let me see if I can explain why. The mother is found uh, shot with a 30-30 rifle, which is a pretty high-powered rifle. It's, uh, people use it for deer hunting often, uh, in her bed. The son is found, of course he's been knocked over by the, by, by the, the shot, but he is found as if he was sitting on the side of his bed, if you can imagine this to be a bed, sitting on the side of his bed and it appears that he had the 30-30 between his legs and he shot himself in his mouth. His, his shoes were off so that he could pull the trigger with his toe. And we thought, gee, this looks like it was the stepson who killed his mother and then killed himself. The, the defense, uh, the, the, the prosecuting attorney said, no, this was staged. Now ask yourself, how can this be staged? This is a 16-year-old boy. Is a 16-year-old boy going to sit here while his father puts a 30-30 rifle between his legs where the rifle barrel is in his mouth and then where the father pulls the trigger. How many 16 year old boys are going to do that? We couldn't think of a single one. And we looked at the case and we went to the lawyers who are volunteer lawyers for the Innocence Project and we said you've got to take this case because this looks to us like it's a murder-suicide not a double murder. That's the kind of case you're going to get in more modern times once these DNA cases are worn out. With the list of issues you have on the board, do you think that, uh, well, would you care to comment about the development of the Texas in one of two states that will execute uh, rapists? Well, Texas, uh, Texas would like to execute rapists, but currently under Supreme Court doctrine they can't. Uh, but I'll tell you what I think one of the real problems with innocence is in, in, in the state of Texas. We are unusual in this sense. Our trial court judges are elected and our district attorneys are also elected. When you're running for office as a judge or a district attorney, what do you have to do? You have to be tough on crime. You have to campaign for being tough on crime. You can't be accused of being soft on crime. You'll lose your election if you're, if you're soft on crime. So there, because of the way we're electing district attorneys and judges, and that combination of the two is unusual. Because of that, there's kind of a, a, a built-in aspect of the system that encourages findings of guilt and encourages rulings that are unsympathetic to claims of innocence. So I think part, a part of this problem of so many people in Texas being found innocent over the past few years 
really relates to this tough on crime mentality that you have to have if you're a DA or if you're a judge in Texas. Yes. It's the state of Texas. Comes from the state of Texas. Comes out of general fund. And the idea, the idea behind it is you have to waive your right to sue. So you have to give up your right to sue the state of Texas in order to get this money. Uh, that's one thing. And after your release from prison, you cannot be convicted of another felony. But those are the restrictions. We have seen case after case in rape cases where all that existed was the victim making the accusation and there was a conviction. Because remember, in not all rape cases do you have DNA. Uh, sometimes the rape accusations are long after the incident occurred. So we've seen conviction after conviction where all, all you had was basically the victim's testimony. We worked on a case two weeks ago, actually, where we had a child victim, and all we had was the testimony of the child. Now, the child was a teenager, but still, at, I think, 14. But, uh, but that's all we had, and there was a conviction. Uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the problems in these kinds of cases is sometimes you just don't have a gold standard like DNA. The DNA doesn't exist. We worked on a case, if I could just mention a, 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 a case that we worked on, occurred not far from here again. It was a murder uh, where the murder used a, a, a shotgun. The only evidence left at the scene was the shotgun shell. So I thought, we'll do DNA testing on the shotgun shell. The problem is the heat from firing that shotgun destroys the DNA. So we had no DNA, and the person who was convicted of this murder was a guy who, he was not tried for eight years. He was out for eight years. He didn't try to run. For 15 years he had been married to the same woman. He was raising two little girls and he held down a job. His only problems with the law had been, well, he liked drinking beer a lot. That was basically his, his, his problem with the law. The only testimony against him was uh, one woman who was at a pay phone, this occurred in a parking lot, the murder occurred in a parking lot, said she was able to see the guy for three seconds, but at trial she couldn't identify him. The other person who testified against him was a teenager who he had called the police on because the teenager was smoking marijuana near his daughters and he did not want his daughters to be exposed to, to marijuana. He's, he's convicted. He's convicted on that limited amount of evidence. A teenager with a grudge against him and a woman who identified him when he was initially arrested but couldn't identify him in trial and there's no DNA. I'm convinced the guy's innocent, but there's no way to prove it. And that's one of the frustrations if you're a lawyer with the Innocence Project is sometimes you get cases where you really think this guy is innocent, but there's no way you can prove their innocence, and you've got to prove innocence. The standard, once a person has been convicted, 
the standard for exoneration is absolute innocence. That's a hard, hard standard to me, particularly without DNA. Yes? We have never seen a case where the federal government has gotten involved in an official misconduct case. Never. And the only time someone has ever been punished for official misconduct in Texas in a criminal case like this, the only time was Judge Ken Anderson in the Michael Morton case. Oh yeah, yeah, and you just you just you just realize well when something makes national news, then the federal government might get interesting, but most of these cases are statewide news or local news at best. Yes. Well, I think that's a good point. I, I think that the main thing is that the Innocence Project had clear evidence that he had withheld information that had put a guy, in pr an innocent man, in prison for 30 years. And this time, the Innocence Project lawyers just grabbed hold and wouldn't let go. And I think that really made, made the difference. Some of the, I've met some of the lawyers who work with the Innocence Project, and uh, some of these guys are just bulldogs. Uh, I, I'll mention one. There's one, uh, Jeff Blackburn in Amarillo. We had him come and talk to the class, and after it was over, I thought two things about it. Number one, I think the man's totally crazy. Number two, I would never want to be against him in court. He did, he was one of the main lawyers, if you're familiar with the Tulia, Texas case, are you familiar with the Tulia, Texas case? I think it was 39 people were put in prison for selling cocaine in Tulia, Texas based on the testimony of one police officer and the police officer lied about every single case. Uh, and so the, the governor actually uh, pardoned a large number of these people who were put in prison in the Tulia, Texas case. But Jeff Blackburn was in that case. To give you an idea of what a bulldog is, he said he focused on that case for five years. Many times he thought he was going to lose Many times he was on the verge of bankruptcy because this was basically all he was working on. But he said he just decided an injustice was done and he wasn't going to give up. And you do run across lawyers like that. When you run across lawyers like that, you better be on their side. <laughs> okay, about one more question. Yes. Never, not in Texas, never used as evidence in court. Because while, while some district attorneys love them and some police departments love them, you can fool them. And uh, uh, pathological liars are great at fooling uh, uh, lie detectors. So they are, they are not admissible in court in Texas.